why I had so many is because of how I titled it. I titled it Hadoop for the Absolute Beginner. Mm. And then <clears throat> I just kind of talked about exactly what you said, which is why why is it important and you know why why this is like pertinent to us. And I think you know, I don't want to give this seminar again because obviously it was an hour seminar and you can find it online. It's all recorded and everything, right? But but if I had to distill it in 30 seconds, like this is like a data warehouse stack right here. Can you see my screen, Brad? Yeah, I can. Yeah. So this is this is a data warehouse stack and it's just huge and complicated. This is the Cognos stack, but this could just as easily be the Microsoft stack. I mean, Microsoft has an MDM process and they have, you know, their change data capture process. I mean, they have all this stuff, right? So if you just have a simple question, but it's on a lot of data, or if you have a complicated question, but it's on a little bit of data, then this stack isn't going to help you. Because if it's a lot of data, you can't, it's hard to get a lot of bad data into, you know, potentially bad data into this system in a timely manner. Like if you go to a BI team and say, hey, I, I want to analyze petabytes in my data warehouse and cube it up, they would say petabytes, oh, that will take us a year <laughs> to do, right? Yeah. Like, and by then the question will be irrelevant. And the data will be twice <laughs> the size. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so if you say, or what I want to do is I want to predict what if this product will sell or not based on past sales questions. And you've got like 100 gigs of data, but the question requires modeling it 100 different ways. It's the same answer. They're like, oh, yeah, we can do that. That'll take seven months, right? And you're like, well, but we're marketing this project for like two weeks from now. So the need for Hadoop is that it like distributes this slide over here. It distributes the process of it over a lot of servers so that you can take a ton of data and just throw it on a bunch of servers and keep the analysis of that data on the same node that the data is on so that you don't saturate the network and so that you don't surpass the, the capacity of any single server. So it's not that, you know, you might ask a simple question like, give me the average, you know, in the book they use the example, give me the average temperature for every weather station I have. I mean, that's a simple question, right? Mm -hmm. But when you have like a million weather stations, then one server is not going to calculate that in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. So you say, okay, well, we'll have this server do, you know, we'll have each server do 10,000 weather stations and then and then maybe we only need you know 100 servers or a thousand servers right we don't need you know we, we won't just saturate one server for a year and that that essentially is just that I mean what you're talking about there is map reduce right you, you you do a little bit of work on a bunch of servers and then you take the results of those and reduce them down exactly it, well it's actually two things so the MapReduce jobs are submitted to this thing called the job tracker. Mm -hmm. And that splits up the computational analysis to the different servers. And th then the trick is to keep the computation close to the data. So if you fed in the data into HDFS, which is kind of what we covered a mm -hmm. little bit last month, but it was really complicated, like the data comes in and then gets split off, partitioned off to the different servers. And then it'll be like a generic input folder. Like let's say it was just a CSV and you say, well, the fold, the input folder is weather station slash input. And so you feed that as a parameter to the job tracker, say, look for the input here, run it through my map functions, have the map functions output it to the reduce functions, have the reduce functions take that and aggregate it up and send it to an output folder on each server. And then once it's on the output folder of each server, then the client can go read it. Hmm. And so it's good for things that are like 
more functional in nature, more like isolated. Like it's not good if you had like a recursive function, right? Where it had to be executed sequentially. Right. Like it would be terrible for that, right? But for something like, okay, we have the same question. We just have a lot. We just have a lot of different inputs to answer the same question. Then that's kind of what it was made for. Which is why it's so good at like search terms and word clouds mm. and all the things that don't require knowing what happened before it. You know. Oh, that's it. That's that's interesting. All the things that don't require knowing what happened before. Oh, that's a, that's a pretty good way to explain it. Like and sometimes if you do have a sequential job, right, where you're like, oh, we do need, you know, we have a 10 step process, right? That's just 10 separate jobs that have to run in order. Mm. So you run, you run step one and then get the output. And then like, if you said, okay, once I know the mean, I also want to know the weather stations that have the highest 10% mean. Well, that's just two jobs, right? Mm, yeah. One job to map reduce and get the mean. <laughs> And then another job to map reduce and get the nodes with the highest ones written separately. Interesting. Written separately, but can run in parallel. Right. Well, no, I think you, you, yeah, run the, each one will run in parallel, but they'll run one after another. Right. They'll run sequentially. So who's the big, the big poster child for Hadoop then? Who, who's, who's the big name using it? Is there one? Well, all everyone. Mm. All the big names are using it. Netflix, Yahoo, Facebook, Google, Microsoft. They're all using it. They're, they're, they're all making projects for it. And then they are also all using it for different things. Yahoo's the big one, but they all use it. And then where does, so where does HD Insight come in? Where does the Microsoft part of this come in to play? Well, it's interesting that you would say that because I was just kind of playing with it. So <laughs> nice. Yeah. So like this is the Hortonworks sandbox. I showed this in my webinar yesterday. And uh -huh. this sandbox, they have a GUI over it. It's called Q. Um, Q stands for Hadoop User Experience. And um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you can use just a command or you can use Hue. This this is Hue. And, um, can you see that? Okay, see here. Yeah, that's yeah. my username. But nice. all the different kind of things you can do inside Hadoop, you can just use Hue for. So one way you can use it is I just downloaded. This is the um, Hortonworks sandbox, and if you just Google that, then you'll see. Like, go to download. They have a sandbox for VirtualBox or VMware Fusion or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, that this is I just used the the VMware VirtualBox when it was free, and then I just run it. And then when you run it, it has this thing right here. You know, like if I zoom in, can you see this? Uh, no, I think I'm missing. You know, that. I, I don't think my zoom is working for some reason. I see your zoom virtual is... machine. Yeah. Okay. Some some reason. Zoom it should be working, but it's not. Anyway, so the point is, um, you see this like HTTP one two seven zero zero one eight 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 eight. Well, when you just do that one two seven zero zero one eight 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 eight, it says, "Oh, here you're in the sandbox." And mm -hmm. so you know, obviously, I'm hitting localhost on that port. It switches you to port eight thousand, and then and sure. now you can play with it. And <clears throat> so I was doing that. You you asked an original question. You said. Hey, how can I play with it using HD Insight? HD Insight's the Azure offering, right? Okay. So in order to really use HD Insight, you have to use Azure and and you have to like pay, you have to pay. <laughs> and the pay is expensive. Like mm. if you want one node, it's like five hundred bucks a month. Mm. Um, but typically with Hadoop, you typically spin it up, do your work, and then shut it down. But I mean, if you do like a three node cluster, you know, you're spending a dollar thirty an hour or something. So you don't, you want to, when you play with it, you want to like spin it up in a few minutes, play with it and then shut it down when you're done. You don't want to like keep it up and running all the time. So HD, but, HD Insights only in Azure, it's not on-premise SQL. So thank you for that. So 
so there's an HD Insight emulator, okay. and it's just in the web the um, web platform installer, mm. and then you get a service, which I haven't really played with that much, but um, let's see if I've got it here. Um, so I thought I had it, but apparently. Um, Oh, maybe it's under Apache. Did you see it here? Oh, yeah, there it is. There it is all running. Hmm. So you install it on Web Platform Installer, and then all this stuff just starts running. Hmm. And so you've got, like, um, Hadoop IO. If you, or you have HDFS, and you have, um, you know, the job tracker and, and everything running as services, and you can just play around with it. As a matter of fact... This is Visual Studio, so I just use NuGet, just you know, the package manager, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I didn't use the console, but they have this thing called, you know, if you just search MapReduce on your online packages, it's Microsoft.NET MapReduce API for Hadoop, and it provides .NET API for MapReduce functionality of Hadoop streaming. And once you do that, you just have, you know, this using statement right here. I don't know mm -hmm. if you can see that. Mm -hmm. And then you can define a C sharp. Um, this is a mapper base class, right? Square root mapper derives from mapper base. And then there's a map function. I got this from Rob Kerr, by the way. And then, and then once you specify the map, now in this case, we're only doing a map. Right. We're not doing the sort and the reduce. Um, but you, the at minimum you don't need a reduce if you just need the map then do the map you know I'm saying hey take my input and just give me the square root of my input right right and then when I call the job in the job class so at the base at the base you just need a map class and a job class and in the job class you spe you configure it using configuration parameters he kind of talks about that in the book for Java but I say hey my input path is this folder and my output path is this folder, and then, and then in my console application, this is just a quick console application, I just call it. I just connect to Hadoop, and I say, hey, execute this job. And then this job, you know, runs. It knows that it needs um, the map, the mapper base, and then the map object, and it just executes. So and that, that input path, you have input square root, that, that's like some data on disk or something? Or... How how are how is the data getting into Hadoop to get mapped? That's exactly right. Yeah. So the input, I would have a text file with numbers in it that sure. are just dropped, and then and then um, the output would just go in that folder. And then you're and then I could it. go and I could look in HDFS at the output, and it would give me the square root of whatever my inputs were. And this and that output would be formatted with a key value pair that you're adding to the context there in the map function, right? Like you're sticking right. to integer and then the actual square root is the key value. This, okay. you mean line 20? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. That's what the output would look like. Cool. And that, so, runs, that runs on that local copy of HD Insight is what you're saying? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if I wanted to do this in Java, you know, I could just call my Hortonworks sandbox and do something similar in Java using his you know, his references that he talks about in the book. Hmm. Or if I wanted to do it in C Sharp, then, you know, I use HD Insight, install it using the Web Platform Installer, and then... I see. So, so, so is HD Insight just the API wrappers over Hadoop, or is HD Insight actually a server piece as well? So that's a good question. So... um so the, the, there's three main people that do Hadoop. There's um, Hortonworks, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's Cloudera. And then there's a smaller player, but there's, they're in it, you know, called MapR. Okay. So these are the three big guys. And everyone who uses Hadoop is using... Not everyone, like I don't think Yahoo does, but 
most of the people who are using Hadoop are using one of these three distributions of Hadoop. Okay. You know, like Linux distros, right? Right, right, right. So HD Insight is actually Hortonworks. Oh, it's not a Microsoft product. Well, it is. Like Microsoft is a partner with Hortonworks. Okay. So. <clears throat> okay, so HD Insight is actually a, dist a distro of Hadoop, basically, is the way to think about it. Right, right. And do they even mention Hortonworks here? Um, so yeah, this is it's and it's specifically for Azure. Um, I mean, Microsoft isn't really bundling this like in Linux, right? Mm -hmm. They're and they don't have, you know, they're using this specifically to use it in in Azure and have you rent time on the servers. Mm. But I think the main thing that HD Insight offers is this, which is you, you want to use Java, fine. You want to use Python, fine. But you can also use .NET. Mm. And you can use like this thing, language integrated query with link to Hive. Mm. So um, Hive is like SQL. It's a ANSI standard for SQL. Um, right. It follows ANSI 92. So you can issue, you know, select star from a table and have it work, you know, in, in MapReduce. I see. So, so they, they wrote a link provider that does link to Hive so that you can translate link queries into Hive queries. Yeah. And then Hive, it's another layer of abstraction, right? Because then Hive queries get translated to MapReduce jobs mm -hmm. and then they get submitted to the job tracker. Hmm. So I'm not sure how fast that is, but it probably yeah. just makes it more accessible. That's interesting. Yeah. Cool. That definitely helped my my disconnect I was having of like why why Hadoop? Why why is this interesting? So that's that's cool. Yeah, yeah. And like I mentioned this and if you want to know where the demo is, by the way, I think I think uh I think Michael Kennedy just tweeted my webinar from yesterday is, let's see, where did he say? Oh, I guess I could just go to where I mentioned, right? So, um, yeah, it's right here. So it's kind of a long thing, but <laughs> that URL right there, that's mm -hmm. it. I guess I could put it in the chat window if anybody else wants to see it. Um, I think if you just go to develop.com and go to webcast, it's probably there too. Yeah, yeah, it's just, yeah, develop.com, yeah. Yep. So I don't think that this book has been super popular. Like, right now we only have three attendees and you and I. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons why it's not popular is because we're on a SQL pass crowd and that those are traditionally Microsoft guys and all the examples are in Java. And it's one thing to say, okay, does the SQL pass crowd know .NET? And some of them do and some of them don't, right? right. But like just getting those guys to use Entity Framework was a big pain in the ass. <laughs> right. So, so getting them to like read Java, I, I just don't think they're going to do that. And I think this book was a little bit overly complicated for what we really wanted to do. Yeah, I agree. So I, I think it's a pretty thick book and a pretty complicated book. So I almost want to kind of ditch it. Yeah. Well, um, it looks like it's just up to us considering nobody really attends. <laughs> I guess it is just up to us unless somebody else has, you know, strong opinions about it. But like, I wouldn't mind picking another book right now and just see if anybody is interested in any other book. Can you guys raise your hand if you guys have mics, Brian or um, Najee or I don't know who Oz is. I think it's Oleg, but... actually. I think we know Oleg from TIG. Oh, yeah, it is Oleg. So raise your hand if you guys have a mic and you want to talk to us about this. But, but, like obviously we're talking data, right? So, um, so we need to keep, I think, our topic in some type of data. Well, it looks like Oleg's got a mic. Let's see if we can unmute. Oh, cool. Him. Okay. Let's see, we'll unmute him. Now. Hey, Oleg. Oh, I just unmuted him. There he goes. There we go. Hi, guys. Hey, Oleg. Did you did you do the reading, Oleg? Uh, yeah, I read the book. 
You did? Yeah, I, I kind of have to grapple with da big data and data in general at my daily job. So we're, we're doing stuff with Hadoop, so I wanted to check out what you guys will be talking about. So what distribution are you guys using? Uh, Cloudera's one. And, and so yeah, and we're also using Spark on top of Hadoop. Oh, cool. So, you, so hang on, this is a new topic. So Oleg's implementation. So um, you're using Cloudera and Spark. Yeah. And then um, do you, are you writing jar files? Uh, we, one of the benefits of Spark is that it has Python, inter, Python API. So we are, we are writing Python instead. Okay, so you're you're writing MapReduce jobs in Python. Yep. And what are you guys analyzing? Well, uh, our company produces uh, predictive analytics algorithms, so like uh, decision tree, uh, decision trees, and we have some regression product. So we are, we are pretty we are pretty much building uh, we are building products for other people to use. So in the in the burn, so, so now we need a, we need to go into the big data space too. But we were selling predictive analytics for like the companies around for thirty years, and the products with the product line I'm working with is like more than ten years, something like that. And what's the name of the company, if you don't mind saying? Uh, it's uh, Software Systems. Is a chat so I can type type or. Yeah, I think you can. Do you see chat there? Yeah. Um, it's, uh, the the first uh, the first word is S A L F O R D. Yeah, Salford, Salford, yeah. S A L F O R D. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have some Google app. Yeah, yeah, that's us. Oh, cool. And so, how big is this company? It looks kind of big. We are not large. The, no, development, no. Um, the, the development team is under 10 people. Oh. Nice. So it looks like uh, Brian said changing books would be cool with him, too. So, um, yeah, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know if it, there's just a better Hadoop book or maybe a smaller Hadoop book, something a little more concise. I think it is, you know, I mean, Oleg obviously has this problem, but it sounds like a lot of people probably don't actually have the Hadoop problem or aren't really in the Hadoop world yet. So what topics should we talk about then? Like, I can give you some of my ideas, like windowing functions. There's an ITSIC book that talks about windowing functions in T-SQL, and th that can be interesting and easy and an easy read. Mm -hmm. um, we can talk about, um, I mean, I'm interested in like a good MongoDB book, but I, yeah, I might I be the only one. I was going to say MongoDB, just, you know, the popularity is definitely gaining. Um, you know, I, I know I know more about Mongo than I do most of these other ones, I think, um, but, but not in the context of .NET. Most of my Mongo experience is the context of Node.js. So using Mongoose and some of the, like Mongoose being the kind of EF layer over Mongo. We can do another book on any framework. Um, we can another book. <laughs> we can do a different book on Hadoop if we think there's an easier one or one that's less Java. Um, yeah. On Hadoop, different Hadoop, excuse me. Um, what else, like? What about we like, can do is the, is there like a I, I don't know the answer to this maybe it's uh, something you'd know is there like a foundational database book like a I don't want to say like set theory or whatever that's a little low level but maybe like platform agnostic like here's the here's the guts to relational maybe relational database or maybe not but you know that that would be interesting to me it's you know the, the database topic is something that's kind of ancillary to my skill set and so i know it but i feel like there's some core tenets to database design that i don't understand so i, so I have i i actually have an idea for a book that might be actually kind of fun to read and 
this guy, I kind of gave you a presentation, Brad, a little bit about some stuff that I've learned from Stephen Few, mm -hmm. where he does um, he does oh, like UI the... design for yeah. dashboarding. Yeah, that would be a cool book. I'd really like this. Yeah, like and then, visualization. Yeah, yeah. So like he has some books that he and Edward Tufte, you're seeing him here, are considered kind of the leaders and this so um that might be fun to read some of those books um looks like they're on the first page so let's put add that here data visualization yeah, Br yeah. brian posted a link in the chat to, the uh, to an amazon oh. book that's like sql and relational theory how to write accurate sql code by cj date that might be an interesting one to look at. That, that actually kind of isn't, sounds like it's close to what I was talking about too, like kind of just theory books. Theory books are hard. I mean, they're sometimes a little too out there in the ether and sometimes people can't stick with it without practical examples, but, um, but it's, a, yeah. Yeah, it's a good idea. Okay. Anything else? Any Oleg, do you have a book you want to read? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I started reading seven databases in seven days. I'm kind of on and off on it, but it, lo it looks decent. Other than okay. that... The problem I have with that book is like, we've seven databases it's, in seven, seven days. Is it seven weeks. seven weeks? Excuse me. Is it's not easy. Like mm -hmm. that book, it's a hard book. There's a lot of like, there's a lot of not Microsoft stuff in there for Microsoft developers. I mean, the databases that they cover are cool, right? They cover Redis, Neo4j, Couch, Mongo, HBase, RIAC, and um, Postgres. So those are all, you know, of these, probably the ones that are the most interesting to me are Redis, Mongo. They're all interesting, I guess. They're all interesting. Um, there, I think they are interesting. The thing we even struggled with when we did this book in the other group uh, was it's a lot of dependencies. You, you have to have environments to get all of that stuff installed and, and you end up, you know, it gets kind of complicated with like getting them all side by side. So it's interesting. Definitely. I, th I mean, I think it's a good book, but again, it, for the target crowd and stuff, um, you know, oh, I don't know. I'm kind of gravitating towards the data visualization one. I think that's an interesting book of compelling and keep people's attention. I, I, and then there's, we can actually do a totally different type of book that a little bit unrelated to data. Like, like um, I know a lot of us are presenters, like this book on um, how to present simple ideas on presentation design and delivery. Like, that could be interesting, but it's not strictly SQL. Yeah. So Stephen Few, if I just click on him as an author, we should see. Okay, so he has this information dashboard design displaying data for at a glance monitoring. This one has 36. Now you see it. Simple visualization techniques for quantitative analysis. Information dashboard design, the effective visual communication of data. That sounds that might be interesting. That one has 95 reviews. So it's 2006. It's not super current, but I'm not sure it has to be um, because it's going to show us about bullet graphs and line charts and things. And let's just see. It's 224 pages, so it's a relatively quick read, right? Mm. And do they have a, they have only paperback. Oh my gosh, we cannot even afford this book. <laughs> look at that it looks look like you that. can only you can only rent it you <laughs> yeah you can't even buy it's it 150 dollars. okay well that's not a good one um designing tables and graphs to enlighten so that's 2004 let's see what if this is more current august 2013 and it's only 17 dollars, and you can actually buy it so that's good and you can actually buy new for 25 dollars at least and 
260 pages. Okay, let's let's think about this one. Um, yeah. And and Oleg, did you have anything else you, you thought? Let's think about this one. Let's put this one over here to the left, and then let's talk about Mongo real quick. And nothing in particular on my end. So I don't know which one of these would be easier. So MongoDB in action it has eight reviews. The definitive guide, um, 23 reviews. I am actually interested in learning Mongo. Um, you know, I think it's still uh, popular right now. There's some. I think Mike Kennedy is probably the one to talk to about the right book. There, he he's got some classes. He's got some classes on Mongo too. There's some stuff in Learning Line, and he's done a webcast on it. And I think he's actually taught at Mongo's headquarters. So I think he teaches next month. Yeah. Yeah. So I think he'd probably be a good resource to find the right book. But yeah, I, I would be interested in that too. So, okay. So let's just look at, we might look at this book, the Mongo, MongoDB for C Sharp by example. Although someone didn't like it. Um, it's, only, and how big, it's only 40 pages. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. It looks like okay, it's probably just right. code or something. Yeah, I think one of the bigger books on this, but it's going to, Mongo's going to have the same problem of like, do you get a definitive guide that's huge or do you get an inaction guide that's smaller? But I think I think we can put it down and then just talk to Kennedy and see what he says. I think he would have the right answer. Okay. All right, well, does anybody else have any? I, I also like the foundational database book, like just a straight up data modeling book mm -hmm. um, would be interesting too. Yeah, I don't know what's out there if, if there's good ones out there. I mean, you know, something that's, you know, if it was SQL Server specific, it'd be okay, but it'd be nice if it's not, if it's just like, how do you design data and how do you, how do you, you know, because that's for me as a developer, that's the thing I run into a lot is even on the project I'm on now, it's like I have a, you know, a decent size object graph, an object model in C sharp. And yeah, I think we kind of blindly just go, oh, we'll just throw that in entity framework and shove it in the database. But there's been a few little rough edges we run against that, you know, I would have liked to have some better backing to say this is how it should be designed and we should fix that data design, you know, but that's kind of the pieces that I, I miss out on a little bit. I guess the only th other thing I could say is maybe an HD Insight book, like Hadoop on Windows HD. So it doesn't look like anybody's, oh, this is, this is the book we read. And then, no, no one's really writing HD Insight books, it looks like. Mm. This one's supposed to come out yesterday. Um, all right. Well, we'll uh, we'll get we'll get back to you guys. We'll kind of post on the group what our next book will be, and um, we'll move on to a next book. You know, next month probably. Sounds good. At... All right, guys. Well, thanks for coming. I don't know that we have anything else we're going to cover today. Okay, well, we'll we'll post the recording and uh, and then when we pick a new book, we'll we'll post that to the group. Okay, awesome. All right, talk to you guys later. All Next right. month. Yep. Bye. Bye.